Hi, this is John Bresden from Manual Galway. So we're going to look today at apps and number systems. So we've seen a bit about um, logic gates and how they can be used to perform various logical operations on input data to provide a certain type of output. Of course, in our mobile phone systems, we have uh, a lot more complex logical systems that are doing all kinds of things from knowing when you know, a phone is uh, left down on the table to turn off the screen to even more sophisticated stuff like handling, handling multiple data signals coming in in parallel and being able to perform many operations, um, logical and otherwise, in the background. Um, apps are essentially um, programs or applications that run on top of a operating system, which is the base software that a mobile phone or a computer um, operates on. And typically these software systems, uh, which have to be programmed, take some kind of inputs and produce some kind of outputs, a bit like the systems we've seen all along. In a mobile phone, the inputs are typically the screen, maybe some kind of buttons or data or sensed information coming from the outside world. And the outputs are, for example, again, the screen, because it's not just an input, but also an output device, maybe sound, some force feedback or haptic feedback, camera, data, and so on. And we'll often have to have um, interfaces between different apps and all of the different hardware, hardware subsystems that exist on our mobile phones. And we saw earlier on in these videos uh, a nice example, the augmented reality um, example using the Wikitude application, which combines a whole bunch of different systems. It's uh, taking input, providing output to the screen. It's interfacing with the GPS to know where you are. It's uh, using the camera, and then it's overlaying some kind of visuals on top of a view of the outside world provided using the camera. So again, an app that's interfacing, um, taking inputs, taking outputs, but also talking to many other types of hardware systems as well. So we have many different types of uh, apps uh, going from the um, the games and uh, leisure apps that we have uh, many of, productivity apps for um, keeping busy, internet apps for browsing online and uh, viewing uh, different social platforms, communications then in terms of um, chat, messaging and um, media sharing apps as well. And of course, millions of apps available on the various stores from Apple, Google, Windows and so on. And by the time you watch this video, no doubt these numbers will be out of date and many more apps on these various platforms. Now we talked uh, two videos ago about the fundamental type of information that makes up all of our digital communications, that being one to zeros. Similarly, software systems such as apps are programmed using some kind of computer language, which is then um, composed of, uh, or, or decomposed into some kind of um, language that the machine can work with, and ultimately in the form of ones and zeros that are then manipulated by the hardware systems, which include our processors that uh, involve transistors, which are switching on and off uh, ones and zeros. Now, of course, coders, well, of course, I say, of course, they used to in the old days work at the ones and zeros level and certainly at the machine code level, but they don't normally work at that level um, unless they have to create their own kind of, um, of, uh, of very specialized platforms that have to work on, on, on the bit level but they usually create some kind of human readable source code that then gets um, transformed into machine code. So we've got two uh, friendly looking aliens here and they are after invading us, but they're having problems with our currency. So uh, question is, why is this alien on the left hand side angry? And what about this person on the right? Why are they uh, angry? Are, are they both angry or are they happy? Um, so what's the... Uh, the idea here. Well, you can uh, perhaps not see this so well in your video actually, but the alien on the left hand side has got four um, digits in total, whereas the person on the right hand side has got two digits. So they're both struggling with our currency because it's all in decimal, which involves um, the digits zero through to nine. And of course, these uh, poor aliens only have four and two digits respectively. However, they probably would have a good time with our um, computing systems because they are all in binary. Well, especially the person on the right with the two fingers. So what is binary? It's a different number system. I've alluded to it before in um, in, in, in previous videos. Um, and I mentioned that we have different types of, of number systems with different bases. So for example, binary is in the base two. It means that we use two digits, zero and one. Octal in the base eight means we use digits zero through to seven. We're used to using decimal, which is in the base 10, where we use digits zero through to nine. And then hexadecimal is in the base 16, 
and we use digit 0 true to 9, plus additional letters representing the numbers 10 true to 15. So we typically use A, B, C, D, E, and F to represent um, those other numbers in hexadecimal. So as I said, we're used to using decimal, that is the digits 0 true to 9, and of course in binary we just use the digits 0 and 1, which is two digits representing binary. And as I said to you, the blue aliens have had lots of fun taking over our computers because um, computers deal with binary and hardware is based on the idea of electronic switches, which are essentially switching between a zero and uh, a zero voltage and a positive voltage. That could be 3.3, 5 volts and so on. We basically have voltages representing these ones and zeros. And typically a switch being on means a binary one and a switch being off means a binary zero. And as I mentioned to you before, um, the uh, the notion of um, of uh, electronic switches uh, largely came about due to the work of Claude Shannon in terms of implementing the uh, theories of uh, George Boole. So some typical binary numbers shown here uh, we have the numbers 0 through to 8 represented there on the left hand side so 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0 and so on. Again think of these as being um, similar to what we have in, um, in decimal where we have basically a uh, in decimal we would have like ones tens and one hundreds think of these as being uh, ones twos fours eights and so on so there are multiples of two instead of um, uh, sorry I should say powers of two instead of powers of ten uh, the number nine here is one zero zero one the number five hundred and twelve is one in the sequence of zeros so you can see some typical binary numbers and our corresponding decimal equivalents and there are ways to move from decimal to binary and vice versa so, for example, when we normally see a number like 47, we know that that means four tens and seven ones, or in other words, uh, powers of 10, 10 to the power of zero, 10 to the power of one, 10 to the power of two, and so on, as we go up, and, uh, up through the different digits. So 47 uh, in the base 10 corresponds to four tens and seven ones, which are seven by 10 to the power of zero. It's similar in binary, except that instead of powers of 10, it's powers of two. So we have two to the power of zero, representing the first place, uh, 2 to the power 1 representing the next place, 2 to the power 2 representing the next place, and so on. So as an example, we have this number here at the bottom, which is 15 in the base 10, and that corresponds in binary to 1, 1, 1, 1. Now again, before I go into this bit here at the bottom, you can think of this as being 1s, 2s, 4s, and 8s. So we have 1, 1, 1, 2, 1, 4, and 1, 8, and we add up all of those 1 plus 2 plus 4 plus 8 works out to be 15. And again, down here at the bottom, it's shown as 1 by 2 to the power of 0, 1 by 2 to the power of 1, 1 by 2 to the power of 2, 1 by 2 to the power of 3, corresponds to a 10 and 5 ones. So that's a, a number in decimal, or in the base 10, represented using, using its binary equivalent. But how do we go from one to the other? So a quick way to go from um, decimal to binary is shown here. And what we do is we take the number in decimal, we repeatedly divide by 2, and then we record the remainder. And when I say record the remainder, we keep dividing by two until we get down to zero, and then we read the remainders upwards, and that corresponds to our number in binary. So for example, 183 divided by two gives you 91 with one left over. 91 divided by two is 45 with one left over. 45 divided by two is 22 with one left over. 11 with zero left over. Five with one left over, and so on. And when we get down to two into one, goes um, zero times and one left over, you can then read up the sequence of, um, of ones and zeros to get your number in, 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 uh, in binary, okay? So we get one, zero, one, one, zero, one, one, one. Again, you can validate or verify that this is actually the binary number corresponding to 183. We can simply uh, take that number and then write it down in terms of its uh, sequence of ones and zeros. So it's one, zero, one, one, zero, one 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 and as i said to you these are powers of uh, two so this is power two to the power zero which is one two to the power one which is two two to the power two which is four two to the power four which is 16 two to the power five which is 32 and then uh, two to the power of seven which is 128 and when we add up all of these, we get 128 plus 32 is 160, 176, and 7 is 183. 
Okay, so that number in binary, again, you can add up the powers of two and you should get the same answer in decimal as we started off with, 183 to the base 10. So we've talked a little bit about um, how to, uh, basically how our different apps, programs and systems are represented using um, digital data. We haven't gone into the actual going from code to uh, that digital data, but again, you understand that it's a sequence of ones and zeros and that that binary information then is used, transmitted, stored and so on from place to place. We also talked about logic gates in our last video in terms of taking some digital data and performing operations on it. But let's say you wanted to make a more complicated system. So let's uh, again think of a, a game or some kind of app we want to create. Um, and I'm going to go right down at the uh, at the bit level, the ones and zeros level, to, to think about how a logical system would actually be built. Now, of course, if you were building a game uh, yourself, you probably would use some kind of programming language to implement it. But again, let's just go to the to a very simple game and see how we would create that from scratch using digital logic. So here's a fun game, which uh, some of you may recognize from the TV show, uh, The Big Bang Theory, Rock, Paper, Scissors, Lizard, Spock, an extension of uh, Rock, Paper, Scissors. Um, I would gladly do this in the video, except that um, we don't have time and there are too many combinations to go through here, uh, as well as all the familiar ones we're used to in terms of rock crushing scissors or scissors cutting paper. We've got all these other ones like Spock vaporizing rock with his uh, phaser and so on. So I'm going to stick with a more simple one, which is the rock, scissors, paper game, where we've got our three combinations. We've got rock, scissors, paper, and we basically have a set of states that we know for a certain set of inputs what the output should be. And by the way, of course, as I said, you can get more sophisticated by um, developing your own games on various platforms like the Arduino and uh, Raspberry Pi and so on. Here's a bunch of um, projects that we've run in the past in our second year module. And actually one of those was an Arduino rock, paper, scissors with various LEDs and buttons. And you can get even more um, into your games. This is a Tetris system that somebody built for another one of these projects, again, powered by an Arduino and a sequence of LEDs, a fully functioning Tetris game. Now, for our rock, paper, scissors game, we basically have a sequence of inputs and outputs. And again, we know typically for, for uh, various types of systems what we expect the output to be for certain types of inputs. So think of the rock, scissors, paper game as being a very um, constrained system where we know for a certain input what the output will be. In this case here, we have a player, the first player who can select either rock, scissors or paper, and then we have a second player who again could do the same thing. And then the output is some indication of the winner or potentially if, if it's a draw to indicate that as well. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to, first of all, write out all the different states. We know that rock crushes scissors, scissors cuts paper, paper covers rock that we had in the picture earlier on. So here is what we can think of as being a truth table. And a truth table is basically a representation of all of the possible inputs and all of the possible outputs. Now we saw truth tables for our logic gates earlier on but this is a true table for a more complicated logic system. We don't know what the logic will be yet, but we know what the inputs will be and we know what the output should be. So what you can see here again is that, you know, we have the known cases here when player one and player two wins. And then of course we have the cases where both of them have the same input and therefore nobody wins, it's a draw. Okay, so we have player one states, player two states, and then the output state, depending on, on who wins, uh, who loses, and if it's a draw. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to represent each of these input and output states by a number, okay? So I'm going to take um, player one um, or player two using rock and represent that as a tree. So if you hop back to the previous one here, you'll see all the instances of rock have been replaced by the number tree. I'm going to take scissors and replace it with a two and paper with a one. So my inputs, you can see player one, player two have been replaced by one, two or three for the various um, rock, scissors, or paper inputs. And then for the output, I'm going to represent the uh, fact that player one wins as the number one, the fact that player two wins as a, as a number two, and then if there's a draw, I'm going to use a number zero. Okay, so that kind of logically makes sense. So we're going to use one, two, or zero to represent the output of um, a particular winner or draw. Now, of course, if I want to start to do this in some kind of digital system, we need to transform from these decimal values to their um, digital or binary um, um, equivalents. 
So we know that um, one in binary is zero one. We know that two in binary is one zero and three in binary is one one and zero is zero zero. So again, I'm going to re represent each of these numbers using its binary equivalent. So three becomes one one, two becomes one zero, one becomes zero one and zero becomes zero zero. Okay, so now we have a sequence of uh, ones and zeros representing player one, player two, and then also the output. And then I want to kind of split these into separate columns to make it easier to feed these into different uh, logical operations. So what I've done is I've just taken player one and represented by the input bits A and B. And player two is now represented by the input bits C and D. And then the output, which is the winner indication, is represented by uh, X and Y. Okay, so I have a sequence now of inputs and outputs and again, you can step back and see how these equate to any of the inputs. But remember that, for example, rock was the number three, which is one, one in binary. Um, scissors was the number um, two, which is one, zero in binary. And then we have basically rock crushing scissors corresponds to um, player one winning, which is represented by zero, one, and so on. This is the reverse. This is... Um, Player two has the rock, player one has the scissors, and therefore player two, represented by one zero here, is the winner. So we now have a logical system with four inputs and two outputs. We need two bits to represent each player choice, and then we need two bits to represent the winner. Now, this is only a partial table because we don't have all of the possible um, input combinations. For example, um, you can see that in this particular table, there is no line for zero 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 for the input. These are basically states that don't occur occur and we can think of them as being just states that we don't care about. In fact, in digital logic we often refer to these as don't cares. Um, now with this tree table we can basically then figure out what's the combination logic we require to implement it. So we know that there's a set of inputs, we know what the output should be, and actually we can now construct a true combination of the logic gates we saw in the last video the combination logic that will make this work. And how do we do it? That's the question. So what we do, this is one particular method, there's other types of methods, but for every output line with a 1, we write out the corresponding A, B, C, D. So if you look back to the previous table, you'll see that there are um, a number of lines here with um, a 1 at the output. Now, we have an output for X and an output for Y. So for example, the output for X here, we have um, three lines where there's one and the output for y we've got uh, also three lines as it happens for the output of one and what we do is we write down a sequence of a b c d's for that particular one when it happens so i'm going to take um the output y to start off with and it says here the y has a one for these three combinations here so i'll go back here to the slide you can see here that uh, y has a one for this case here for this case here, and for this case here. And what we can write down then is that that corresponds to A, B, C, and D not. And the reason it's A, B, C, and D not is because that has the value of one, 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 and zero. We write down a not for the value of zero. This one here then corresponds to A, B not, C not, D. And this one here corresponds to A, B, C, D. Okay, so they all have a value of 1 apart from A, which is a value of 0. A not, B, C, D. So we have a, an expression for Y, which is this. Y is equal to A, B, C, D not. A, B, C, D not. Um, A, B not, C not, D. A, B not, C not, D. And then A not, B, C, D. And we write this in what's called the sum of products term. Because we've got a product, which is the A, B, C, D not. We've got another product, which is A, B, not C, D. And we've got another product, which is A, not B, C, D. So this is a product. It's A, dot B, dot C, dot D. And then there's a sum, which represents the sum of those products. So this is called SOP, or sum of products um, form. Now similarly, we could do the same thing for X. And again, we'll go through the same kind of sequence. Um, I'll just choose a different uh, color pen here for this. So for example, for um, 
x, again, we would do the same exercise. We would look at the lines where x is equal to 1, and we would write out the sum of product terms then for x. And x would be equal to the first one there, which is a, b naught, c, d, because it's 1, 0, 1, 1. And then we've um, a naught, b, c, and d naught. And then for the last one there, it's a, b, c naught, and d. Okay, so we have um, again three terms, three, three uh, products, and they're summed together. First line is a, b naught, c, d. Next line is a naught, b, c, and d naught. And next line is a, b, c naught, and d. Now, what we now have is actually some logic that we can implement using a sequence of AND gates, NOT gates, and OR gates. And actually, if we built the system using this sequence of uh, AND gates, OR gates, and NOT gates, we would have a fully functioning um, rock, scissors, paper game for player one and player two. So as I said, this is the summer products form for Y. I also shows you how to do the same thing for X. It's a combination of AND gates. This is a four input AND gate because the inputs are A, B, C, and D naught. Another four input AND gate where the inputs are A, B naught, C naught, and D, um, and so on. And again, you would use an inverter or a NOT gate to create the A, B, sorry, A naught, or B naught, or C naught, or D naught as appropriate. And then you would feed the output from those AND gates into an OR gate, for example, a three input OR gate. So that's the summer products uh, term for the output y. As I said, there's another summer products term for the output x. And the combination of those two together will give you an indication of who wins or who loses or if it's a draw. Now, this is actually the logical combination of logic representation of, um, of the inputs and the outputs. So um, we have a, b, c, and d here are the the inputs representing the, um, the the choices of player one and player two. I've got what I call here a little bit of a hack here on the left hand side where I'm using some buttons here for the inputs and they're connected in a certain manner here to these OR gates to produce A, B, C and D. And I'd like you to have a think about this. Why are we getting the desired combination A, B or C, D for player one and player two from the sequence of buttons? Have a little think about that. Maybe work that as an exercise yourselves. So anyway, imagine A, B, and C, sorry, A, B, C, and D, as in the true tables we had earlier, they are going into the, um, the various um, AND gates here and uh, producing Y. So this is, again, exactly as we had on the previous slide. We have A, B, C, and D naught. That's this uh, first term up here, A, B, C, and D naught. You can see D is being inverted. Um, so that's A, B, C, and D naught being, uh, um, being put in here into this OR gate. And then we have A, B naught, C naught, D. A, B naught, C naught, D, going into the OR gate. And then the last term is A naught, B, C, D. So again, A naught is, A is being averted, B, C, D going into the OR gate. And this is the sum of products. This is the, the sum. And these are the three products. And then you'll get your output for Y. And again, remember what's happening is that if uh, Y is a one, that means player one wins. Um, and if uh, x is a 1 and y is 0, that means player 2 wins. And if both of them are a 0, then it's a draw. Now, you can also, and we're not going to go into details of how to use Carnot maps, but you can also actually go and further simplify the expressions for x and y to reduce the number of gates involved. There's a method called uh, Carnot maps, which basically involves taking the elements from the the, um, the the true table that we had already. If we uh, go back to the true table, we basically had um, nine different states. So for example, for X, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine uh, different states. The three cases um, when X wins, the three cases when X loses, and the three cases when it's a draw. And we can fill these into what's uh, called a Carnot map. As I say, I'm not going to go into details of how to construct these, but just for now, it's enough to know that the nine values occur here, and then we have a whole set of don't cares that we can also fill in. And we can basically then use some uh, rules to basically reduce from this uh, expression here for x 
to this expression for x. Now, the two routes we can we can do this. We can use uh, what's called Boolean algebra, various Boolean expressions that allow us to simplify this complicated Boolean expression into a more simplified one, or we can use the Carnot map um, system, which again there's a sequence of rules you can apply to the values in the Carnot map, which will arrive at this simplified um, expression for x. And the main important thing here to notice is that, well, why do we want to simplify? What's so great about that? Well, if we were actually building this rock, paper, scissors game for real, and we want to sell a million of these, you're going to have less logic gates required in the simpler version. And if you're building a million of them, you're going to have obviously a large cost um, implication there as well. So, and of course, less things to go wrong as well if there's less gates. So this one here has got um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight gates, well, we saw it in the previous slide, for x alone, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight gates for the x part, and there's another eight gates for the y part. And we can reduce for the x part from, from eight gates down to uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, um, eight gates. But the thing here is that these gates, it's eight gates as well as it happens, but these gates are actually, um, they only have three inputs and they're cheaper than, than the four gate inputs. Now this is um, just one example. In most um, examples where we use Boolean algebra or Carnot maps to reduce, we will get to an even simpler form perhaps than, than, than uh, shown here. Um, and again, we could do the same thing for the Y implementation and again, get to some simpler version by using Carnot maps or Boolean algebra. As I said, I won't go into details here, but you'll probably be covering this in later courses. Now, I just want to finish by showing you an implementation of this rock, paper, scissors using Logisim. So Logisim is a great application you can download um, for free online and uh, it allows you to basically model um, either simple logic or combination logic systems. So again, as I said to you, have a look and see if you can figure out how this input works here. These are buttons that you can turn on and off and uh, there isn't a lot of um, uh, functionality to adjust here in Logisim. You basically have a little hand here which allows you to turn on and off different buttons, turns on the values of these input buttons. So think of them as being like switches as one to zeros. And then you have um, basically inputs, outputs, and logical gates here. Okay, so you can easily just drag different elements from here and uh, well, click on these different elements and you can, you can draw them on, on the canvas as appropriate. But what I've done here is I've basically um, basically drawn the the logic um, combination logic for y and x that we've just been talking about there so this is the sum of products for y again it's a b c d naught and so on and you can see a b c and d coming in here into these different inverters or gates and so on um, and so we have the sum represented by the or gate the product represented by an and gate and we've got three products here being summed together to give us y as well as the you know the the a B, C, and D, or its complement as appropriate. Um, so again, have a look at where the buttons produce, or how the buttons produce the appropriate value of A and B corresponding to our tree table. But for now, I want to just show you how this um, actually uh, is actually working. So for example, player one is rock, player two is scissors. You would expect that rock crushes scissors and therefore player one wins, as you can see here. And that's essentially kind of highlighting or turning on a sequence of um, of connections here in the combination logic that produces in the, in the ultimate result of player one winning. So we've gone from the idea of a, um, a game here, which is rock, scissors, paper, to a functioning implementation. And again, you can change these values as appropriate. I'll change this to paper. So paper should cover rock, and now player two wins. So player two is paper, player two wins. And of course, if they are both the same, you would expect that um, it's a draw because neither is winning. So. That's it for today and uh, I will see you in the next video. Thanks.